This is the Open University. How do I keep up my levels of morale? at a time when the world seems to be going to shit, in fact, is going to shit. Speciesicide, the slowdown of any form of progress, absolute uh, bullying, nationalism, fascism returning, all these awful things happening. I'm not going to comment on it. There's no point in me adding to the, uh, the litany of woes and chaos that you're seeing on your timelines and on your news lines. Um, but I, I think you'll find that when I talk about how I keep my morale up, it does obliquely talk about it as well, talk about all the problems that confront us. Um, spring, obviously, uh, and early summer helps to keep my morale up. We're in June now. Two years ago in June, I was in Tokyo. Uh, I always feel nice and safe in Tokyo. And actually, it's interesting that the, um, the Black Experience in Japan, which is a YouTube channel I follow, just mostly black Americans talking about living in Japan and how they like it. And, and you might expect there to be a lot of comment on racism in Japan, but actually quite the opposite applies. I think they're all really talking about how they've escaped American racism. This is particularly true of one interview I, I watched recently with uh, some people called Wendell and Anne Kinet Lewis, who was sort of working in Okinawa and um, had been detailed there as part of the US military base and were um, supplying the military base, but then went back to the US to try to live again in the US, decided that it, that was a big mistake and came back to Okinawa. Uh, and and um, Wendell basically says in this interview that uh, he feels safe in Japan, whereas he doesn't in the US, uh, which is very telling. It's very telling. Um, I, it's very important. Uh, the way I felt in Tokyo, I, I could dress, I could express myself much more uh, kind of flamboyantly without any fear of being, because I felt like I was in a bubble of freedom, a kind of, you know, semi-logical freedom to, to basically say the, make the statements I wanted to make without fear of uh, being looked at askance or bullied or attacked or whatever. Although I was controlled twice by the police uh, in Tokyo, something that didn't happen so much in Osaka, but in Tokyo, the police will stop you and ask to see papers you know, to prove that you haven't stolen your bicycle and whatever. But, I mean, you know, it makes a refreshing change to be part of the mistrusted minority, um, I guess, when, when here in the West it would generally be people of colour who are stopped and controlled in that way, if not worse, as we were seeing. Oops, I wasn't going <laughs> to directly comment on that. But um, here in Berlin... Uh, it's kind of halfway between what the sort of anomic and violent anarchic kind of conditions in the US and to some extent the UK and, and Japan's safety. So I feel safer in some areas of Berlin than others. I feel mostly very safe here. I, I, I'm ranging around a lot now. Normally at this time of year I'd be in Italy or somewhere, you know, globetrotting somewhere. But this year obviously I can't do that. So I'm sort of globetrotting within Berlin going up to unexplored areas, um, using public transport in a fairly reckless way with my face mask on, in my little bubble. Again, this idea of the bubble. Um, but uh, one of the things that keeps my morale up is um, a kind of a sense of, first of all, living in a country where, where the um, ruler is, <laughs> is Angela Merkel, who is someone I, I trust and, and I'll be very sad when she goes because I think she's one of the few politicians who inspires confidence, along with um, Ahern in, uh, Jacinda Ahern in New Zealand and um, Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland. We have great female leaders now and we need more of them. Um, not because they're female, because obviously Theresa May was not a great leader, but um, uh, you know, there is a, some sort of correlation between being reasonable, <laughs> a reasonable person, not being an absolute outright fascist and being a woman, it seems. But um, also I kind of like the European project because there's a kind of this a sense that there is still here a kind of overarching rationality which you, and I, I turn to um, and a sense a sense that there is a belief that government can be a force for good and so I turn to channels like uh, Deutsche Welle, uh, Arte, which are both government financed you could say if you're cynical 
their propaganda stations to make the state look reasonable. But I don't mind that, you know. I don't mind states that want to look reasonable. At least they want to cling on to the, the appearance of morality and uh, rationality. Uh, unlike the US state or the Australian state or the British state, who have decided to become, you know, sort of glitzy clowns, if not outright fascists. So, um, France Culture is another example. This is a government subsidized culture channel, which I listen to a lot, um, mostly in the form of archives of uh, Une Vie en Oeuvre, which is a, a series about writers, and NHK World. NHK World last week had a fantastic documentary in their premiere slot, um, a documentary about Okina, which is the precursor of no theatre. It's about a thousand years old. And it goes back to priestly, if not shamanic, rituals, which were imported partly from China and Korea, but um, became very characteristically Japanese in the sense that they're to do with uh, um, Shinto and seasonal change and uh, the marking of ritual, the ritual marking of the change of seasons and all that stuff. Uh, transformed into a, a form of theatre, outdoor, mostly outdoor theatre, in which shamanic actor, musician characters are enacting welcomes to the, the spring and that kind of thing. So we had uh, Ruichi Sakamoto in this documentary talking about how Okina had become, uh, and it's very much to do with the drums and the flutes, uh, the sound of that music, the drums representing water apparently and the flutes representing air. Um, something that's been very important to me, representing air passages and you know, with flute-like sounds on my current album, which is due out in just a, just over a month, along with my new book. Um, plug, plug. But um, Sakamoto is always a refreshing voice, I think, and he was he was talking about how how he looks to the past in order to envisage a future which is more harmonious and more gentle. And he used the word refined. He tries to imagine a more refined future. It's really quite a struggle, isn't it? <laughs> when we look at the way history seems to be turning, it's not towards refinement, is it? And yet those of us who do want to be refined, I mean, along with wild, I'm quite wild in some ways, but I'm also refined in other ways. I quite like the tension between wildness and refinement, um, between the primitive uh, and the, um, the sophisticated. So I guess you could sort of map the past and the future to those things as well. Uh, we come from a primitive past and we still have those primitive instincts, but we also aspire to refinement. And aspiration and uh, restoring your morale are, are quite closely related. Um, a couple of years ago I had this project to buy an old house in Japan. I had one in mind particularly, which was an old uh, townhouse in Tadanoumi, which was only one minute's walk from the local station, the Kurei Line station. I was kind of uh, talking about it before in these broadcasts, but I, I didn't reveal the location because I didn't want anyone to snap it up. But someone has now bought it. I was possibly even going to go in March with the McClymonts, who, who live in Australia. They planned to go to Australia and uh, to Japan, and they invited me to join them. And we were going to look at this house and decide whether maybe we would jointly buy it. I don't know. We could both holiday each year in this place. Um, but it's been bought, so I can now show you the photographs of it. They're appearing <laughs> here on my left. And um, it was uh, a kind of vision of a future, a refined future, where I could be just working on restoring a house, perhaps, and um, living by the sea and taking trains into cities, because I'm still very much a city person. I love cities. But the idea of having a sort of semi-rural uh, place to retreat to was, was appealing. Um, but the, um, along with all these government stations with their kind of high mind, because NHK World, you could make fun of it because it's, it's kind of in some ways very old-fashioned and paleoconservative as a, as a station. It's full of very heartwarming stories, kind of 1950s-ish, a bit like the picture post in 1955 or something. You could imagine a similar atmosphere of heartwarming pictorial, editorial pieces about you know people in the countryside who are growing cherries with, with lots of heart, you know, absolutely. Or going back to old recipes for sweet, uh, I watched something yesterday about um, uh, Nagasaki, and, uh, you know, of course it could have been, you could have made a contentious program about how Nagasaki was destroyed by the Americans, but actually they chose not to do that. They, they made this very um, uh, heartwarming 
piece about how the sugar route uh, through Kyushu had started in Nagasaki and how they'd been importing sugar from uh, and, and other things from the Dutch and from the Portuguese because Dejima was there, the trading port and all the rest of it. So, I mean, it's, it tends to be educational, it tends to be uplifting, and it tends to be heartwarming and uh, moralistic in a way, in a very old-fashioned way, which I find charming. Um, I, I go along with it, knowing that it's a kind of fairy tale uh, sponsored by the government. But um, the other thing that really uh, raises my morale is um, my favorite magazine, which is um, Jutuku Kosha Tokushu. I can never pronounce it. Jutaku Tokushu. Jutaku Tokushu. Uh, which I guess just means new house building, new residential house building. And the projects which are always my favorites are shopfront projects which are on arcades in, uh, like in the May edition there was a, a house in, in Tottori, it was called Small, uh, um, small Library, um, House with Small Library and it was designed by Hiroshi Kinoshita and Associates and uh, it literally had a, it was on an arcade, one of these covered arcades, a shopping street in, uh, in Tottori, which is quite a small semi-rural town, you know, with hills, mountains, uh, just around it. And um, it had this public space, which was a library, which anyone passing on the arcade could go into and browse the books. And then it had a private space behind it. Um, and a similar project was my favorite in the June edition, which is a renovation special. Uh, it's um, in Tatsuno, which is a samurai town about 70 kilometers west of Kobe. Uh, on, on the road to Okayama, on the railway to Okayama. There's another reason Japan is safer, because bicycles and railways are so much more important than cars, because cars, of course, apart from policemen destroying us, uh, cars destroy us, uh, not only in physically hitting us by monopolizing our urban spaces, but also by polluting the gas with fossil fuel emissions. But anyway... Um, so, uh, yeah, take the train uh, west from Kobe and you'll hit this town, which is called Tatsuno, an old samurai town. And uh, so there was a stationery store in the shopping area. Again, uh, the government, uh, local government um, planning regulations counts for something here because uh, you're allowed to, it's much more easy in Japan to have um, mixed live-work spaces. That's been a a feature of Japanese life that you had family businesses. A lot of it's got many millions of small family-owned businesses, of course, Japan. And if you have that, you often have the premises and your house on the same in the same building. So the people restoring this uh, um, place in Tatsuno decided to make a uh, uh, a little uh, to keep the sign which said stationery. It was an old stationery shop on again an, an arcade. They kept the original sign. And they kept a kind of semblance in the front of uh, a stationery store, which they refer to as a, uh, a street garden. So people can look in and see, you know, displays of washi paper and some supplies of stationery. Of course, stationery stores have a, a, an appeal to people like me, people who, who love uh, art and creativity and drawing and, you know, doodling, whatever. You, you kind of love just going in and fingering the paper and smelling the ink the pelican ink or whatever, that gives you, that already is morale boosting, a stationery store in and of itself. So they kept this little kind of oasis, um, the shop front idea, which is, which is an idea which can only flourish in a, a, a situation of trust. If you have an anomic city full of destitution, prostitution, addiction, you know, drug dealers uh, everywhere, um, a city where it's not safe and where people don't trust other people, then you obviously can't welcome people into your shops. You know, a lot of shops in that kind of area have grills up. Uh, uh, of course, everywhere now has these transparent grills up so that we don't infect the, the workers, the frontline workers in retail. But um, uh, the, the kind of less advantaged areas, they, they really do have grills up, especially in booze shops and things like that. I mean, I've lived in those areas too. It's part of the gentrification process that urban pioneers, so-called, <laughs> have to go and live in really shitty neighborhoods, especially in the US. Danger, when you're in your 20s usually, you have to go and live in a dangerous area, which is the, nevertheless gentrifying, and then there's this struggle with the indigenous residents who resent the uh, rents going up. And, but at the same time, there is an improvement process going on where uh, maybe those grills are eventually taken away and you get some organic uh, delis and things like that coming up. Uh, this idea of the commons, 
is really strong in, in these sort of projects which inspire me, the shop front. I mean, actually the house I was looking at uh, in Tadanaomi, which is the um, port where you embark for the rabbit island, which is one of the least threatening environments ever in terms of you know people going there on day trips to pet rabbits, which are tame but at the same time has this dark background because it used to be a chemical research facility for weapons. <laughs> so it still has these rather, these ruined uh, um, labs which uh, were for wartime research into how to poison people. But um, yeah, Tatna um, the house there was a, a candy store. It was actually referred to in the listings as old lady candy store. And the price went from, I think, 33,000 down to about 25,000. It looked like it was in some state of disrepair, but it had a lot of potential as a beautiful machia, which if it were located in Kyoto would have been um, tremendously expensive, but was very, very cheap. It was, yeah, 20, 25, I think it probably went in the end for about 25,000 euros. Um, and, you know, lucky owner, um, I hope he, he or she does something good with it, um, and maybe turns it into something with a semi-public facade, because, you know, turning it back into a candy store, for instance, would be a rather nice gesture. Um, uh, one thing I like about restoration projects, and this new edition of my favourite architecture magazine is a, is a restoration special, is that um, it's a bit like when you're writing a song around a sample. You have to respect the kind of strangeness and the otherness, which is incarnated in the sample. It's not something you would have arrived at by doing everything from the ground up and designing everything according to a, a preconception. The sample is something that's appealed to you because of its strangeness and because it's something you wouldn't do normally. It's, uh, you have to respect its otherness and, and then incorporate it and build a new structure around that, that otherness, hoping that you'll preserve some of that intact, but also making it, domesticating it a little bit and bringing it into your conception of the world and your schema. So, um, like making a song around a sample, making an, a, a reconstruction or a restoration of an old structure, of course it um, brings in ideas like wabi-sabi and patina, respect for the past, and, and that combination of the, the, the past and the future again, which uh, is what Sakamoto was talking about with uh, the restoration of okina, this ancient theatrical form, that's um, very morale-boosting and... Uh, Humbling in some way as well, because you're not just imposing a vision, a, a preconceived vision, your vision of the world. You're, what you're doing is um, sort of negotiating with someone else's vision of the world. And that's what I really plan to do in Japan if I were to have restored one of, my, uh, one of these old houses, which I might still do, who knows. Uh, but it, it looks like this international kind of transit thing, is, which was central to that idea, is no longer feasible. Let's see. Um, but um, it was it dependent on me being able to shuttle around the world, but also dependent on this idea of the safety of Japan, the sense of um, the commons, which the Japanese still have, because it's still very, very safe, traffic-wise, and um, in terms of lack of anomi. Anomi is just the sociological term for um, a lack of common shared values. And... Um, it comes out of the work of Dorkheim, uh, who studied suicide and said that suicides were, were suffering from anomic states. Anomic states are basically when you don't believe in anything. You, and obviously believing in things, or legitimacy, as Max Weber would, would have described it, you need... Oh, legitimacy is kind of a lie. That there is no um, scientific way to prove that a state or a state of uh, the conditions of your life are legitimate. But you sort of do need to believe in something that other people believe in and you need to be on the same page as other people and to trust other people, to trust other people's at least outward compliance to a set of norms that uh, everyone agrees are good things. And this is the problem in the West just now is that we've had seen a total disintegration of the norms that have been built up over the last decades, the post-war consensus of how to live, how one should live. There's a kind of vindictive, spiteful as long as, the, as long as my enemy is suffering, I'm okay. That, that's become the new kind of norm. And it's not, a, it's not something I'm comfortable with. Um, but maybe I'm just a bien pensant bourgeois, you know. Maybe this is the new, the new order. I certainly hope not. But to, to restore my, my sense of morale, I need to, to look at things which uh, don't seem to confirm that everybody's a massive asshole or a fascist.
but going back to the kind of normality that I knew a couple of years ago, like, for instance, booking concerts. I've just booked a concert in uh, my, my first and probably only concert in 2020, which is happening in Graz, in the Kunsthaus Graz, on October 24th. At least it's penciled in for that. We don't know if it'll actually be able to go ahead, but it's part of a festival in Graz. And um, the Kunsthaus Graz was part of the reason I accepted this concert, uh, this engagement, because... Um, uh, it's actually a, an amazing structure designed by uh, Peter Cook, who was a member of Archigram. Never, I never quite know if you were meant to say Archigram or Archigram. I think it's Archigram. Um, and Colin Fournier also, uh, uh, architect on that. And it's a biomorphic blob in the middle of this rather conservative, traditional 19th century style Austrian town. Um, and the irony is that it, it took this conservative town to build something as radical as Peter Cook's vision, this blob, blob architecture, blob architecture, whatever the word is, uh, which couldn't be built in Britain, although he's a British architect. Um, archigram, archigram, <laughs> whichever it is, uh, was, was a radical um, group of architects in the 60s uh, who... Um, for instance, Ron Herron uh, in 1964 uh, unleashed a, a series of inflatables, and actually the um, Kunsthaus Graz looks like one of the, it, it looks like a sort of weird kind of sea creature, which has got lots of chopped off tentacles or something, which are the windows. But um, it's um, it was trying to get away from the idea of a museum as a white cube, make something much more blobby and um, rounded and uh, like some kind of either extraterrestrial or subaquatic life form, which has just landed in the middle of this rather conservative town. <clears throat> it relates to a couple of ideas which Archer Graham had. Uh, Michael Webb, for instance, was another member, and he came up with these uh, ideas of the Suter Loon and the Cushical. These are kind of new forms which are micro-architecture. The um, Suter Loon and the Cushical, both kind of, the suit alone is like a suit that you wear that can inflate and provide a kind of architectural space around you with all the basic technologies that you <coughs> depend on. Um, and the Cushical is like a, a, a sort of a dome, an inflatable little dome, which um, is like a cushion which becomes large enough for you to retreat inside it. And actually the first thing I did when I moved to Berlin, I had an empty flat on the Karl Marx Allee, and it felt like a... a Remise à zéro, uh, going back to the origins, to nothing, to flatness. And I thought, what, what's the first thing I should buy? I mean, I need something to sit on, first of all, in this um, house, this flat that I have. So I bought this dome, this inflatable plastic dome, which uh, I put in the middle of a big empty room and started living in. I would sleep in it, you know, and <laughs> it looked like an igloo. I remember having parties, people like Jason Forrest, uh, came along to this, and, and La Plantine, and people, all these musicians that I'd kind of uh, befriended uh, in Berlin came and, uh, and bounced on the, you could bounce on the outside of it, and Mumble Boy came along, and uh, E-Rock, and people like that. <clears throat> all these people who were um, pioneering the sort of glitch forms of the early 21st century with this progressivist idea of that music could actually evolve. Of course, Mark Fisher came along and ruined everything by saying that the future had been cancelled and there was no more progress, there was no more artistic progress. Music wouldn't make the leaps that it had made, just as technology stopped making the leaps that it was making in the 60s and 70s. You know, people stopped being sent to the moon or whatever. Um, all this disappointing stuff, which has really um, snowballed in the 21st century, where we, we stopped anything progressive, really, socially or technologically progressive, and seemed to start rolling backwards. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, it was <laughs> my early Berlin years were involving this kind of structure, which was actually in retrospect, very archigram type structure. And um, I then started doing the typical Berlin thing, which is going to flea markets and buying secondhand stuff, uh, old stuff. So it was, a, a, that, again, this combination of a, a futuristic thing and a, a, a retro respect thing. So, um, Actually, this, this sort of technologies, the, the individualistic technologies which Archer Graham imagined, are materialising around us, unfortunately, for very bad reasons, uh, uh, like the coronavirus, or to protect yourself from the police or whatever, you know. People have to walk around in onesies, um, hiding their race, hiding their racial characteristics for fear of being set upon by thugs and hooligans. But... Um, 
uh, I've noticed myself now when I'm I'm uh, out in public. I have a I have a face mask on. I have dark glasses on, and um, <clears throat> I have often my Air, AirPods in, um, and uh, with noise cancellation technology. So it's almost as if there is a bubble, not just this physical bubble where you're physically restricting the breath of other people or the noises other people are making from reaching you, but also the. Um, the echo chamber bubble, which is that when you're in the public spaces, which are increasingly digital public spaces, the commons is increasingly a digital commons, uh, you actually want to filter out opinions which are not your own opinions. Getting increasingly difficult because, um, for instance, I, I actually unfollowed a couple of people today on my Tumblr feed because I didn't want to have to read screeds of text. T Tumblr for me is a, a visual thing. I just want to see pictures, mostly pictures of you know Japanese street scenes and things like that. But um, I didn't want to be reminded of the same stuff that I was reading about in the newspapers on my Tumblr feed. Important though it is, and although I do obviously agree with it, I didn't want it all to be duplicated. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, that, those are the kind of insights that <laughs> I wanted to give you today. Um, how to raise your morale. And it is partly about going into your bubble, but just remember that that is not necessarily quietism. Not being an activist is not necessarily being a quietist. I think our aspirations and our need to have uh, another focus than simply the news cycle is an important part. A utopian focus as well, like Sakamoto's idea of living more in a more refined way. Um, that is important as well. Uh, there has to be a way forward. There has to be a sense of progressiveness and, and a sense of there being some kind of higher callings for society and for mankind as a whole, humankind as a whole. There has to be um, that kind of high-mindedness which the government stations like NHK and Deutsche Welle and France Culture and Arte are trying to, um, to peddle. Uh, and you can know that it's a fiction and yet still know that it's necessary. It's kind of like religion in that sense, that you can believe that there is no such thing as God, but still believe that religion is quite a can be a positive force um, in the sense that, it, that people have a spiritual dimension that needs to be expressed in some way. Yeah, that's, that's really all I'm uh, going to tell you today, and um, thank you for your attention. Open University.